Mark 8, chapter 27, through to chapter 9, verse 13. We're going to study it later. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God but of men. And he called to him the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what, to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man should have risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. With this reading, we've come to what I've called the watershed of Mark's Gospel. Everything seems to build up to this point, and then everything flows from it. It seems as if for two years, Jesus had been waiting for something, and as soon as it happened, he was off to the cross. And so it all builds up to a peak. And this is true not only of the meaning of the story, it's true physically. Because Mark's Gospel begins at the lowest point on the earth, at the Jordan River. And at this point we are now at the highest mountain in Palestine, Mount Hermon. And so everything does build up and then from the top of this mountain he comes down to the cross. So we've reached a peak. And in place of all the wandering around, crossing the Sea of Galilee, healing a person here, teaching there, we suddenly have a tremendous sense of purpose. 
And straight after this we shall find our Lord heading for Jerusalem. Well now we can say all this another way. In the first eight chapters of Mark, and you'll realize we're exactly halfway now. In the first eight chapters of Mark, and in the second you notice some very big differences. For example, here are five differences that you will now notice as we go through Mark. And this is the advantage, by the way, of taking great chunks of the Bible together. When you only read a few verses a day, you miss all this. But when you read it through in large doses, you see it all. After this story, miracles and parables almost disappear. Now, you might never have noticed that before, but you'll notice it from now on. Secondly, he stops teaching the kingdom of God and speaks much more about the Son of Man. Thirdly, he now deals primarily with the disciples and not the crowds. Though the crowds appear from time to time, he is now concentrating on the handful of disciples. Fourthly, whereas the first eight chapters are in the north in Galilee, the second eight chapters are in the south in Judea. And fifthly, from now on it seems as if the sun goes out and the darkness comes, just as it's doing outside. Have you ever been out walking on a lovely day such as this afternoon with the sun shining from a blue sky and then a little cloud has appeared and got larger and larger until it's blotted out the sun and then the sky has gone darker and darker and you think there's a storm coming? That's what happens from this chapter onwards. So far it's all been bright and sunshiny and people are being healed and it's all been so lovely. But now the clouds begin to gather, the storm clouds darken and it's only a matter of time till tragedy strikes. It's most dramatic. So we've been building up to this and from now on a complete change. Now what was Jesus waiting for? What was it that he was wanting in all his wanderings around Galilee, what was it he was after? Why couldn't he get on with what he'd come to do? He seems to have been frustrated to this point. What was it? The answer is very simple. He was waiting for an answer to a question. That's all. And until he got the right answer to the right question, he couldn't get on with his ministry. And in this first passage we read, we get the question asked and the right answer given. Now, at the risk of repeating myself, because I know I've taken part of this before, perhaps on a Sunday morning it was, I want to remind you of the place where the question was asked. Away far in the north, the very furthest point north in the Promised Land, there was a village in the Old Testament called Dan. Beersheba in the south, Dan to Beersheba. Dan was in the far north. A little village nestling at the foot of a mountain 9,200 feet high and always snow-capped. And this mountain comes down to the plain, not in a slope, but it comes down at this point as a sheer cliff and the village is at the foot of this high rock wall. And from the bottom of the cliff, inexplicably there comes a whole river as wide as this church there isn't a hole to see it just bubbles out from the rock there must be some underground cracks and a wide river comes straight out of the hill like that it's called the Jordan it's a river that starts nowhere and finishes nowhere it's a most dramatic river and there just above the place where the Jordan comes out is the village of Dan Originally it was called Balias, after the god Baal, because this river seemed to them a symbol of life, a symbol of fertility, and Baal worship was fertility worship. And so they had Baal worship at this very place. But then in the Old Testament they worshipped God here. And then later still when the Greeks came to this place they, they thought of God too. And they found a little cave by the river and they said that is the cave where the god Pan was born, the god of nature. And so they called the place Panias after the god Pan instead of Balias after the god Baal. And to this day it is called Banias. And when I visited it, 
Recently there it was, the little Arab village of Banias, now in Jewish hands since the Six Day War. Well now, still later, the Romans came. And this town was renamed after Caesar by the man Philip who governed this area for them. And it was called Caesarea Philippi. And he built a magnificent gleaming white marble temple on this spot, dedicated to the Caesar God, to the emperor who was worshipped as God. Now here then was this place, a little village and yet a place in which you saw a cross section of all religion. A place in which some believed in gods who had taken the form of men like Pan. A place in which other people believed that a man was God, Caesar. A place when God and men seemed all mixed up. A strange place where a river began from nothing. A place of mystery. And to this village our Lord led those twelve men. Now he said, I've got a question to ask you. And there were two parts to the question. First part, what do other people really think about me? Who do they say that I am? What do they think? Tell me. Now he knew perfectly well, but he wanted them to say. Now we know that some people thought that Jesus was mad. His family did for one group. And others thought other things about him. After all, a man who calls himself the great I am is a man who will be thought to be mentally defective by others. There were others who accepted him as sane, but thought of him as a great man of God, one of the prophets. But most people were saying this kind of thing. A young man of 30 cannot possibly be what this man is. A young man of 30 can't be as clever as he is. A young man of 30 can't be as powerful as he is. It's impossible. He must have had a previous existence. He must be a reincarnation of somebody else who's lived a long time ago. And so some of them thought, well, it might be Elijah come back again. And some of them said, no, it's somebody greater than that. What about John the Baptist? But men were thinking that this young man in his early 30s must be a reincarnation of a great man who had lived before. That was the opinion of men. And now comes the question which every man has got to answer sooner or later. Who do you say that I am? Second-hand opinion is no good for Jesus to build on. Your mother and father and grandmother and grandfather may have had the right ideas. That doesn't mean that Jesus can do anything for you. It's no use telling him what other people think or what you've been told to say. What do you think? And the disciples stood there stunned and shattered and teasing their minds. What do we think? We've lived with him. We've talked with him. We've eaten and slept with him for two years, two and a half. What do we think? Who is he? Now they had some extraordinary facts to go on, some of their own observations. Here they are. First, he was a man who never lost an argument. That's a remarkable fact. He was a man who was never beaten by anything or anyone. He never lost control of a situation. He was a man with no faults in his character. He was a man who had uncanny insight into other people. He was a man with complete self-confidence and authority. He was a man who knew God better than anyone else. Now these were the observations on which they had to go. Now who do you say that I am? And in the silence, Peter spoke up. Dear old Peter. He was always opening his mouth and putting his foot in it, but this time he didn't. He opened his mouth and he said, You're not a person, you're the person. You're not a prophet, you're the Christ. And the difference is in the word a and the. He wasn't a man like others. He was something quite unique. You're the person. And this word Christ, you have to be a Jew to get the, the flavor of it. They had been waiting for hundreds of years for the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the one who would solve all their problems to be sent from heaven to earth. They'd been waiting. And so Peter said, you are the Christ. And with this key, the door was unlocked and they saw the truth. 
the first time this question had ever been asked in history and it got the right answer the first time. Now they were in a position to learn far more about him and for the first time he began to speak about the cross. There are a number of things I'd like to say to you before we move on that apply to you. First, you will never understand what Jesus does for you until you know who he is. There is no point in talking to you about the cross until you believe that the Jesus who died on it was more than a man. If he was just a man dying for you, then there's no sense to it. There's no meaning in it. The cross can't do anything for you. You'll never understand what Jesus did for you until you know who he is. And that is why Jesus never mentioned the cross until they'd answered this question rightly. Because if Jesus was just a man, however great a man, if he died on a cross, then he's dead and gone. But if he was the Son of God, then he's still alive. Now the second thing that I want to say about that as related to you is this. It is no use having a second-hand opinion about Jesus Christ. I was brought up with the right opinions about him because my parents held the right opinions and they taught them to me and I went to Sunday school and church but I went away from home at the age of 16 and I got away from second hand opinions and I found out very quickly that I had no first hand opinion about Jesus. I'd never thought it through for myself. If somebody had asked me who is Jesus, I'd have said the right words, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, but it would have been a second-hand opinion, not mine. It would have been what men had said he was in my presence. It would have been something I'd picked up from my environment. The important question is, who do you say? Have you ever thought it through? Have you ever read the Gospel of Mark right through and then said, who is he? Who is he in yonder store? Who is he in great distress? Who is he that from the tomb? Who is he? You've got to answer that for yourself. Nobody else can do so. Now at this point he qualified what had been said with two shattering additions. Addition number one he said you mustn't tell a soul. And they were bursting. They'd been waiting for hundreds of years to meet the Christ, the Son of God. And now he was here. They wanted to tell the whole wide world. And he said, don't tell us so. You must keep it quiet. Now why should he say that? The answer is very simple. Because people had the wrong ideas about the Christ. They wanted a political savior. They wanted someone who'd come and, and put all their troubles right except one, their own sin. They wanted someone who would release them from the Romans. Someone who would release them from fear, but not from self. And so he now goes on to add the second qualification. First, you must be quiet about it. And second, do you realize that the Christ must suffer and be killed? And this they had never thought about. What kind of a leader... What kind of a liberator, what kind of a hero is it who says, I've got to be murdered, I've got to be put to death, I've got to suffer? They had been like most other people in reading their Bible. They had remembered all the nice bits and none of the horrid bits. They'd remembered all the wonderful things said about the Christ, but not the passages that said he will have to go through it, he will have to suffer. And dear old Peter, having said the most wonderful thing, now opened his mouth and did put his foot in it badly. And he dared to turn to Jesus and said, No, Jesus, you've got it all wrong. You're the Christ. I, I know this. I've just told you this. But you're not that sort of Christ. No, you're not going to be a suffering Christ. We want a victorious leader who will fight, not someone who will give in to his enemies. And Jesus had to quarrel with Peter, his best friend. It's a tragic scene. Do you know, if the devil came to me as a little imp, a black imp with horns and a, and a spiked tail, and tried to tempt me, I should recognize him straight away and I'd say, get out of here. I should do what Martin Luther did and throw my ink pot at him. 
if he came like that but you know I've never met a devil who came like that you meet a devil who can dress up as a messenger of light a devil who can speak to you through your family through your nearest and dearest through your friends and when Jesus turned around and looked at that fisherman he saw the devil speaking through him and he said get behind me Satan get out of my sight Satan don't let me look at you can you imagine what Peter felt like then Peter was so human somebody has said that Peter was so full of humanity he was spilling it all over the place wherever he went he was so full of our impetuosity aren't we all a bit like this having said something good and true and helpful we can't shut up we've got to go on talking and the next thing we say is just the opposite and dear old Peter he'd said the right thing just a few minutes before so he thought he could open his mouth again and that the right thing would come out again but it doesn't you can be inspired by God one minute and inspired by the devil the next there is a time to speak and a time to be silent Peter is in the grip of human logic he's thinking like men he's not on the side of God now he's on the side of men and men want the easy way and men don't want to suffer and men want the easy and comfortable road to glory and men want the glory first and men are not content to have the struggle in this life and the joy in the next they want the joy in this life and this is the human way of thinking not suffering not difficulty not discomfort not being killed but life and enjoyment and happiness now and so Jesus calls together the people who know him nearby and he says listen I'm going to tell you something I must tell you something that you must understand listen if you're going to follow me you'll have to share the suffering it is not easy to follow me it is not comfortable to follow me if the Christ must go through suffering to glory so must you oh thank the Lord that Jesus was honest because I find so many Christians today I would call them many Christians have either never been told or never realized that it's the toughest life of all to be a Christian that it's going to be hard that it's going to be suffering that it's going to be tough from now till you die whoever would live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer says the New Testament and before any youngster says I want to be a Christian I want to say have you counted the cost do you realize that you're going to follow Jesus the Christ and that the Christ says the glory is on ahead but the suffering is here in the world you'll have tribulation if you want to follow me it's not a bed of roses it's a crown of thorns and he says to the crowd as he's tried to say to the disciples that the pathway to glory is through suffering in this world he's now going to say to anybody who's thinking of following him there are four things that you'll have to rethink first if you're going to follow me you'll just have to deny self you can't have any self and follow me you've got to take that self and crucify that self it's a life of a cross and you'll be crucified I remember talking to a missionary out in Africa a missionary who was killed by bandits just a short while after I talked to her and I remember asking her about the danger that she faced as she walked through those dangerous roads alone and I asked her if she was ever afraid to die and I'll never forget her answer she said I died ten years ago I died ten years ago and a few weeks later when she was killed just for the contents of her handbag I remember that phrase I died ten years ago do you realize that to be a Christian is death to self it's to take the capital I and cross it out and so Jesus said if you're going to follow me you'll suffer this you'll suffer the loss of self because it's got to be crucified secondly he said you've got to denounce safety if you're concerned with security and safety then don't follow me I had a very interesting letter this week and I won't tell you who it's from or what source but somebody was telling me that I was quite wrong to go into the Baptist ministry because it had no security was from a minister from another 
denomination and that there was no security. Is that really what we're after in life? Do we want security? Do we want safety? Is, is it all self-preservation? Must we look after number one? Let us be fools for Christ's sake. He said if your concern in life is security, safety, a nice, comfortable, safe life, then don't follow Christ. Because he who lives for his own self-preservation will lose his life. But once you've lost it for his sake and security and safety and no longer your concern, you find your life. And history is strewn with examples of Christians who in the eyes of the world have lost their lives but in the eyes of God have found it and are now alive and live. Thirdly, success must be devalued. A man may gain the whole world, he may build a business, he may extend his branches and, and get on, as we say, and a man may have all that. And Jesus said, what is that compared with life? You may be so busy making a living that you never live. Success has got to be rethought by the Christian if you're going to follow Christ. In the eyes of the world, you may be a miserable failure as a Christian. But in the eyes of Christ, you may have found the only success that really matters, to live for him. Fourthly, you will have to defeat shame. Jesus said this is an evil and adulterous generation, which means as soon as you follow me, you'll be a misfit. As soon as you follow me, you'll be ridiculed. As soon as you follow me, people will laugh at you. People will look down at you. You're in a minority. And you will be tempted to be ashamed of me. And you'll be tempted to keep it under your hat that you belong to Christ. Because people don't like God in this world. It's an evil and adulterous world. It's gone after other gods. And if you say that you belong to God and you're a Christian, you'll be laughed at, you'll be ridiculed, you'll be mocked. And Jesus said, don't be ashamed of me. Or it'll make me ashamed of you. A man came to me some time ago and he said, you know what? He said, I found another Christian in our office. I said, that's fine. He said, I'm a lay preacher and he's a lay preacher too. Isn't that great? I said, that's wonderful. And then do you know what he said? It took all the edge off this discovery. He said, do you know what? Isn't it amazing? He said, we've worked in that office for 12 years and we never guessed. <coughs> and that somehow took the edge off the gingerbread. Ashamed of Jesus, sooner far. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me now, then one day when I come, I'll be ashamed of you. How could that be? Well, can you imagine this scene? Can you imagine Jesus is coming again and every eye sees him and all those other people in your office see him and suddenly they see you alongside him and they say, well, I never knew he, w he belonged to you. He had anything to do with you. I never knew. How will you feel then? When Jesus comes again in glory, we shall be so proud, so proud of him. So thrilled for people to see his glory and to know that he really is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We shall be so proud, but how will we feel about ourselves when people see us alongside of him and say, I didn't know you had anything to do with him. So he said, if you're going to follow me, it's going to be tough, really tough. I must tell you that if you follow me, the road lies through Calvary to the empty tomb. It lies through suffering to glory. No crown without a cross. And therefore self goes, it's killed, dead. That's an awfully costly thing. Success or safety rather, security, denounced. Success devalued. Shame defeated. That's the cost. But here are two incentives. First incentive in the future, you'll see Jesus coming in glory one day. Won't that be worth it? Won't it be worth all the suffering, all the struggle, all the ridicule, all the tribulation that you go through to see Jesus come in glory with all his angels in the clouds and to know that he's coming for you? That's the first incentive. And the second incentive is this. Jesus said, you won't even have to wait for me coming in glory to have some encouragement. He said, I tell you, there are some standing here listening to me now who will see the kingdom of God come in power. What did he mean? The key word is the word power. When did power come? 
The answer is on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. And one of the encouragements and incentives to the Christian to help him through this struggle and this hard road is the Holy Spirit given to him now. Power now. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost now. That's what makes it worthwhile. You can have this now. And so with the power now and the glory hereafter, can't we face the struggle? Can't we follow him? Now we come to the third part of tonight's and the final part of tonight's study. Peter had already said, you are the Christ. Now he was going to see it. The great confirmation, the beginning of phase two, begins very like phase one, a voice from God saying, this is my beloved son. At the baptism in the Jordan River, God said, this is my beloved son, thou art my beloved son. Now phase two begins with another voice from heaven up top of the mountain, this is my beloved son. Phase two begins much the same way as phase one. Now where is it? It's a week later, right up on top of this mountain among the snows, the glistening white. They have climbed up, just four of them, Jesus, Peter, James, John, just the four. It is towards evening, the day is fast spent, the night is darkening, they're up on top of this mountain, the snow is glistening in the last dying embers of the sunset. They're tired, desperately tired, and the three disciples settle down for the night and pull their robes around them to keep warm. They are going to go to sleep, and Jesus is a little way off praying. They never did get to sleep, according to my Bible. Something happened that kept them awake. Suddenly, instead of the darkening sky, it seemed as if the whole place was going brighter and brighter and brighter. And when they looked around, they had a most extraordinary vision. They saw Jesus so bright they could hardly look at him. And the description tells us that the light was coming through his clothes from inside them. It wasn't that a light was shining on him. It was a light shining out of him. And his clothes were almost transparent. Have you ever put a torch behind a piece of cloth? That's the kind of thing they were describing. And dear old Peter with down-to-earth language describing it to Mark years later said, you know, no detergent on earth could have got his clothes that white. No fuller on earth could have bleached it that white. It was just shining, glistening white. Do you know the whitest clothes you can get in your wash? You wait till the next snowstorm and go and hang your whitest clothes against the snow and see what they look like. And yet he was glistening brighter than the snow on the top of Mount Hermon. It was a most amazing, mysterious, almost weird experience. And they were terror stricken at first. And then they looked closely and they saw two people, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. Now have you ever wondered how they knew which was Moses and which was Elijah or which was anybody? It's one of the proofs to me that when we get to the glory we shall recognize everybody straight away. People have asked me, how will I recognize my loved one? I've got older since they went. How will they recognize me? The answer is in exactly the same way as Peter and James and John knew it was Moses and knew it was Elijah. Don't you look forward to getting to heaven and saying, why, there's Simon Peter. I've always wondered what he looked like, and there he is. And there's Paul. Well, he's not a bit like what I expected, but there he is. That's Paul. And you look around, above all, have you ever wondered how you'll know Jesus well? You'll know instinctively straight away because then we shall know as we are known now. And so they knew it was Moses and Elijah talking. They were on the edge of the universe. They were on the edge of eternity. They were having a glimpse into another world. What was the significance? Well, I could talk for this for too long, much too long for you. For you so let me just say a few things. First, it means that Moses and Elijah were not dead but still alive. God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And when I stood and looked at the tombs of those three patriarchs in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron, I thought they're not there. Their moldering bones are there, but they're alive. God is still the God of Abraham. Abraham is still loving God. 
And so is Moses and so is Elijah. Some people I meet try to drive a wedge between the Old and the New Testament as if the Old is not true and the New Testament is. Moses and Elijah and Christ belong together. You can't drive a wedge. They talk together. It links the past with the future. The total plan of God through the ages is revealed in this event. It also leads to something about the future. They were seeing something that one day every Christian in this church will see, and indeed everybody will see, the glory of Jesus. I have a picture in my home called King of Kings. I meant to bring it tonight, but I forgot. It's a picture of Jesus surrounded by 259 kings of history. And they're all in their robes, their scarlet and their gold. But he's just got a white robe on. And the white robe is glistening white. It was so white that no painter has ever been able to repeat the luminosity of the robes in that painting. Maybe some of you know the picture, King of Kings. They were seeing his glory, which that artist was given the power to recreate with his oils. And one day you'll see the glory. They were catching a glimpse of what Jesus looks like when he's in heaven. They were catching a glimpse of his glory that he left behind when he was born at Bethlehem. They were catching a glimpse. And you know, years later, many years later, they still talked of it as if it happened yesterday. Listen to John writing at least 60 years after the event. He said, we beheld his glory, glorious of the only begotten Son of the Father. Listen to Peter writing years later. We were eyewitnesses of his glory for we were with him in the holy mountain. They were seeing the glory of Jesus. In other words, Peter said you are the Christ and now God says you're right Peter, have a look. Peter said I believe that you lived before but not on earth as a man in, in heaven as the son of God. And God says Peter you're right, look at the glory he had before. And it was the great confirmation of the great confession of Peter. It was proof to him. Oh, Peter, don't spoil it, but you did. Opened his big mouth again. Poor old Peter. Did he want to join in the conversation or what was it? Did he feel a speech was necessary? There's always someone around who feels you should make a speech. And so Peter felt that he must make a speech. And he said, I'll tell you what. We'll build three shelters, three shrines for you and you and you. Let's build three shrines. It's a wonderful moment. I'd always like to remember it. Let's build something on the top of this mountain that people will be able to come to and remember. And Peter had made two terrible mistakes. He wasn't rebuked by Jesus who didn't speak to him. He wasn't rebuked by Moses. He wasn't rebuked by Elijah. He was rebuked by God himself. The first time Peter ever heard the voice of God direct must have been like thunder. And God thundered from the sky. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And that voice of God tells us the two mistakes Peter made. At the foot of the mountain Peter had said to Jesus, you're not one of a group. You're not one of a category. You're unique. You're the Christ. But now what is he saying? He's saying, Jesus, you three. Do you see the mistake? He's putting Jesus back among the great men of the world, back among the great prophets. He's reduced Jesus to one of a crowd. You three. And God says, this is my beloved son. And suddenly a cloud blots out the other two and they only see Jesus. God says, stop talking about these three, Peter. This is my beloved son. I've only one son. This is the one. You're going back on what you said, Peter. You said he was the Christ. Now you're putting him among the others. And the other mistake Peter made that God rebuked directly. God said, listen, listen. You shouldn't be talking now. You should be listening to what he has to say. And if Peter had listened, which he didn't, do you know what he would have heard? What was Jesus talking about to Moses and Elijah? Do you know what he was talking about? He was talking about the cross, about his death. Jesus needed to talk it over with someone and his disciples wouldn't understand. So Jesus had to go into heaven to understand. He had to reach for two saints of God from centuries past. 
to talk about the cross. Moses understood. Elijah understood. And so they talked about the cross. Peter says, God, listen. Listen to him. If you're going to understand anything, you must listen to Jesus. Sometimes in church we do too much talking and not enough listening. Sometimes in our private prayers, God wants to say to us, listen. Listen to him. Stop talking. Listen. And he will tell you things that you need to know. Now Jesus turns to them and says again, you must not tell anyone what you have seen. Not until I've risen from the dead and then you can tell the whole world. They wouldn't understand it until I've died. But after I've died and risen again, you can tell them, you saw my glory. You saw what I was like before I came to earth. You've seen it. Tell them. But not till then. Then they asked him a little question about a Jewish belief based on the Old Testament that before the Christ came, before the Messiah came, a messenger had to come to prepare the way for him. And many Jews thought it must be Elijah who had to come first. And so they said, what about this belief? If you really are the Christ, then why hasn't the, mes the messenger come first? Why hasn't Elijah come first? And Jesus said, but he did come. Do you know when it says of John the Baptist that he wore camel's hair cloth and a leather girdle, do you know that there's only one other man in the Bible mentioned as wearing that type of clothes? Do you know when it says that John ate locusts and wild honey, there is only one man in the Bible otherwise mentioned who ate that, and that's Elijah. Read 1 Kings 19, and it's mentioned there. Elijah has come, said Jesus. Not the Elijah who lived long ago, but the messenger has come. And it's all taking place according to plan. But, says Jesus... The Bible that told you the messenger would come tells you that the Messiah will suffer. And don't you realize that if they kill the messenger, they'll kill the Messiah? Don't you see yet? Do you see what he's trying to say all the time to them? We'll find it at the end of chapter 9. We'll find it in chapter 10. We'll find it in chapter 11 and in chapter 12 and 13 and 14. Jesus is trying to get it into those disciples' minds. Suffering is the way to glory. Trouble is the way to triumph. Apparent defeat is the path to victory. Can't you see it? It's in the scripture. They've done it to John. Can't you see that when a really good person lives in this evil world, they're bound to suffer? Can't you see it? But the tragedy is that they couldn't. I have just two more thoughts for you tonight, which to me are lovely thoughts. First thought Jesus came down from the mountain. Do you realize that Jesus could have stepped back into heaven with Moses and Elijah as easily as I talk to you now? He could have avoided the cross and all that suffering. He could just have gone back into glory so easily. But the next verse in the Bible states they came down. And he came down from Mount Hermon all the way to Calvary. Voluntarily. And he left behind the opportunity to go back to glory. The other thing is this, and I find this more thrilling still. Jesus is coming down from heaven again one day and he'll come with that glory, that shining burning light. He says it'll be like lightning from east to west when the Son of Man comes. Blazing light in the sky. I can't imagine what it'll be like. But two things I know. First, we shall see him as he is. The experience that only Peter, James and John had that evening is an experience that you will have. And the other side to that is this. We shall see him as he is. And we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Do you realize that one day your clothes will shine like that? Do you realize that one day the glory of Jesus will be yours? Do you realize that we're told in the Bible that if he calls anyone, he will justify them. And if he justifies them, he will glorify them. 
And it means that he'll give you the glory that Jesus has. I'm sure you know the glory song. Come let us sing Jesus is King. You know that song, don't you? It's called the glory song. There are two sets of words to it, both of which are right. One of which is, glory to Jesus, the lamb that was slain. And the other is, oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me. It's quite legitimate for the Christian to look forward to the day of transfiguration. The day when we shall be changed and made like him. And meanwhile, reflecting as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are day by day being transformed into the same image. So that one day when his glory shines upon us, it will be perfectly reflected. Let us pray. Our Father, these skeptical, scientifically conditioned minds of ours find it so difficult to imagine the things of which we've been reading. Just to think that they really did happen. We can hardly imagine what it was that Peter, James and John saw when they saw the glory of your Son. We can hardly imagine what it will be like when we share that experience and when others looking at us will see his glory in us too. We can't imagine it, but we believe it to be true because it is in your word and you have never broken your word. We pray that you will help us to look forward to this. We pray that from time to time in this service, in our worship, in our private devotions, we may catch a glimpse of the glory of Jesus that will help us to face the struggles and the ridicule and the cost of daily discipleship. Lord, we know it's not going to be easy. We know that there are burdens to carry. We know that we must deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow the Lord Jesus. Help us to do so. Help us to face the cost. Help us to walk the way that he walked, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is now seated at your right hand in glory. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen.